because I'm excited to introduce our final panel, which is specifically on media for advocacy. We're spotlighting three Black media makers who work at the forefront of community advocacy and thinking about what the future holds for local, independent, and grassroots media, particularly media makers and media that um, center issues, stories that might otherwise be excluded from sort of mainstream storytelling and coverage. And I think this is going to be fun because, you know, in the, the second panel of the day, we talked a lot about um, sort of what it looks like to cover activism from more um, mainstream or traditional media spaces. But these folks can really speak to media as activism. Um, so uh, without further ado, let me represent them and then we will jump right in to the questions. So Aisha Simmons is an award-winning cultural worker who for 25 years has examined the intersections of race, gender, sexuality, and sexual violence. Her creative work, published writings, international lectures, and independent scholarship are informed by her lived experiences as a child sexual abuse survivor, adult rape survivor, and Buddhist. Aisha is the producer, director, and writer of the internationally acclaimed and award-winning feature film, Know the Rape Documentary, which if you haven't seen is wonderful, I use it in um, uh, teaching settings all the time. And her latest work is the 2020 Lambda Literary Award winning Love with Accountability, Digging Up the Roots of Child Sexual Abuse, an anthology that she organized and edited. Welcome, great to see you. Um, next, we have Noala Cabral. She is a, an award winning filmmaker, cultural producer and teaching artist. Noala developed a youth program, the youth program at Black Star Film Festival and currently oversees youth media programs for high school students, including the award-winning journalism program Poppin, which is based here in Philly. Uh, Noala is the co-founder of FAN, Fostering Activism and Alternatives Now, which is a media literacy and activist project formed by queer women of color. Hi, good to see you. And last but not least, we have Tahid Chappelle, um, he's the program manager for Free Press News Voices Project, focusing on the program's Philadelphia initiative to reimagine how the city's local newsrooms approach their coverage of crime, violence, and the criminal justice and carceral systems. Previously, he worked as a social media editor at the Washington Post before joining the Philadelphia Inquirer as an engagement editor, where he analyzed reader behavior on search, social, and digital platforms. Welcome all. It's really great to have you. Um, Hi. So it's so great because um, I know you all in different capacities through like media advocacy, activism um, spaces, and I'm familiar with all of your work. And so I'm really excited that we have the three of you together in conversation. Just as a reminder for our audience, um, this is intended to be, you know, a friendly and formal conversation. I'm going to throw questions out and these three are welcome to sort of take them where they like and, and exchange ideas as needed. Um, we also have the Q&A feature turned on. So if you have questions for these folks, please pop them in the Q&A. If you see questions already in there, you can upvote them. And uh, we will get, we will, we'll, we'll take at least 15 minutes at the end to include questions. Some of our other panels today, we've had such great questions in the Q&As that we've actually just gone to the Q&A sooner. So we'll, we'll see how it goes all. Um, so, I want to start with something that's sort of a bridge from the second panel that we had today. Um, we had Chandra Kumanika and um, Stacey Marie Ishmael and Wesley Lowry talking about covering activism. And um, Stacey Marie made this really great point about the fact that often um, the stories that Black media makers tell, even if they're simply objective reporting about uh, Black experience, about inequality, about injustice, are labeled as activism, when in fact, um, sort of all stories and all media and all narratives are an activism in some way. Um, and so I'm wondering, um, as folks who sort of more align with the idea of media activists or media advocacy, what you see the role of Black media makers playing in community and social change in relation to sort of other activist projects and organizations. And you can speak from your own work or, or, or more broadly. And there's no formal order, so jump in if you want to jump in. Okay, I'll go first. I'll go first. Um, you know, one thing that I, I like to say uh, 
since being in Philly and, you know, I lived in different cities. I've lived in Phoenix, Sacramento, uh, DC, um, Philly, I, I really appreciate the type of just media and information sharing and journalism that activists and activist organizations do on the ground because it really is, um, it really is the, 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 the community of reporting in Philly, I think is, is just as, if not sometimes better than the journalism that we're seeing in a lot of the local media ecosystem because it's coming directly from community members who know their neighborhoods, who know their backgrounds, who know these sources, who are connected um, to these issues. And um, I, I think that it's been wonderful to see that, you know, the, the standards that a lot of black journalists and journalists of color that they have to work within a framework of objectivity, that a lot of the activist journalists have that freedom, so to speak, to, to write that narrative and, and raise these issues in the way that they know will get seen. So it's, it's been interesting to see uh, that aspect of it in a city that is very active, um, not to say that the other cities weren't, but is very, very active on a lot of different overlapping issues. So it's been nice to see that kind of difference in style and, and vernacular used in, in coverage from the community side. Thanks. Well, speaking as, I mean, I lived in Philly all my life, 51 years, and then now I'm now in DC. I just moved <laughs> during the pandemic. And I just couldn't agree with you more um, around um, the issue of activism. I mean, I learned the craft of storytelling, media making in Philly um, at Scribe Video Center, um, studied with Tony K. Bambara and Louis Messiah. Um, and so just thinking about all like just generations really of, of media makers who've come through um, there and, and are doing so many incredible things, not only definitely in Philadelphia and beyond. Um, and so just in terms of how the, the as, as Tony would say, there's the official story and then there's the real story. So the official story is the mass mediated story, right? And then there's the real story. And that for me is like what drove me to, want to become um, a filmmaker, a writer, because um, she really, she wrote about it, she talked about it, but she was like, the role of the artist, of the writer is to make revolution irresistible. And so learning um, how to use the camera lens and the written word to um, shine light on um, subjects and topics that are not often covered um, in mass media. Now, it's shifted now because, uh, I mean, because I studied with Tony in, in the early 90s, so it's a, it's a whole different world in 2020 because of social media um, and, and, and just that we can pick up our phones and document in ways in which that just wasn't even possible, um, thinking about being in high school during the um, the MOVE massacre, the bombing of Osage Avenue, I like just what could have happened if we had the kind of technology that we have now. Um, but there is just that, that radical um, um, voice, if you will, um, and it's everywhere, but just because all of you are in Philly and I'm still connected to Philly, just thinking about the ways in which um, um, the media makers have really been able to to spin um, the official story so that people could see the real story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, uh, I think I would just add, um, for me, similar to Aisha, actually my, um, my filmmaking was my entry point to, to activism and advocacy. Um, the, my first documentary was about women of color and hip hop. And it really kind of took me on a journey to learn more about media literacy um, and media activism. And then my, my other film, Walking Home, was about street harassment. And at the time, I mean, this was back in 2009, street harassment was something that we experienced, but it wasn't a part of a national discourse at all at that time. Um, but social media, um, through social media, the discourse was was percolating. <laughs> it was starting up. And um, when I put that film online, um, it really took on a life of its own because of the activists all over the country um, who who saw it as a tool, right? Um, to to talk about essentially to talk about rape culture. And so um, that film uh, and then the entry point entering that, that kind of sphere of activism and organizing 
um, with with fan at the time, fan mail it was kind of um, it was a it was an exciting time to to build and to recognize the power of media and storytelling and narratives um, and how they shift narratives. Um, I think at the time, like one of the goals was to make um, to make street harassment seem taboo, which like now it's you know. Um, now we're in this this era of um, Me Too where we're talking about rape culture more, but um, basically that experience took me on a journey where I realized, you know, I made the film because it was a personal film about something I was experiencing on a daily basis. And um, thank, shout out to Third World Newsreel and Scribe Video Center for helping me really um, finish, complete that film. Um, but essentially it was a personal film. It was a story that I, personally could tell and was invested in, um, but that resonated with others. And I think um, as a media educator, something that um, I always start with with my students is, um, you know, what is your story? Because everyone has a story to tell. What is it, uh, what is your story? Because, uh, and, and why are you the one to tell it? Um, so, yeah. Yeah, thanks, that's great. Um, so we've heard a lot in recent years about sort of the increasing corporatization of mainstream media institutions and uh, uh, so the way that power works in those spaces. And I'm wondering if the three of you could reflect a little bit on how this has affected or if it's affected the grassroots and independent media environment and what kind of challenges folks who are doing um, activists and grassroots and independent media um, face um, maybe as a result of sort of the corporatization of media and what kind of support you all need in doing your work. Well, um, you know, it's, it's, it's so interesting because when I think about when I started working on my film, No, um, the rape documentary in the 90s, a film about sexual violence and healing um, in black communities, it, you know, it's just, it's a very different world. And I, I only say that to, to say that, to um, underscore that it is true in terms of like the, the, the corporate own um, media, right? That it's it's just it's it's and what happens is that I feel like the media keeps shifting. It's like they 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 we we win wars. <laughs> I mean, we win you know we win the struggle, but we keep still having to fight the war. It's like you know they keep trying to they keep figuring out ways to co opt um, incredible and radical work that's happening. But despite this, I, I again point to all other venues in which how the work is, can get and is getting disseminated. So while definitely, you know, people want to be able to use the have access to the large platforms um, out here in terms of broadcasts or you know in uh, web-based platforms, that there are ways in which the stories um, can get told. I think the struggle is is really about the funding to 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 get that and and to to be able to to support your work and while it's it is exponentially cheaper and again I'm thinking about media film and, and that way um to make the work it is exponential it once was it still costs money um and so really trying to to um get funders and funders beyond like I think it's great for GoFundMe campaigns and everybody who has resources to donate. I love that. I think that's very powerful. But I also think that, you know, corporations and I mean, foundations have responsibilities and they have to, I mean, there there's a push where they're being pushed to take chances, if you will, and, and support radical work. Um, and then as someone who is a survivor and who's queer, like I, I think, and clearly black, that it's really important that when we talk about racial justice, including gender and sexuality, that we're talking about sexual violence, eradicating it as a form of um, radical racial justice. And I think that that's, that, that is some struggles that um, media makers um, do face, media makers who are, who are feminists, who are queer, in terms of trying to get funding. And it's like, do we do we fit under black? And then if it's gender, is gender just red as white? I mean, so those are the like the, the ongoing struggles that I, I see happening um, that we have to keep pushing against. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So I just, um, I know you read my bio, but I think it was a little bit older. Um, 
because um, right now I'm, I'm not actually teaching youth media right now. I'm doing, um, I'm a program officer at the Independence Public Media Foundation in Philly, which is a new private foundation which supports local community media making in the region. And um, so I'm, I'm, I'm still kind of, I'm doing, I'm still learning a lot. I've been there for a little over a year and, you know, I'm um, a lot more comfortable in uh, talking about uh, media making, I suppose, and, and at youth, youth media and activism. Um, but I'm trying to, to bring that, those experiences and, and those perspectives to this work in philanthropy. And some of the um, things I've observed so far that uh, I'm interested in and, and uh, still um, unpacking and um, thinking about is, uh, for example, the um, the tendency um, for foundations to shy away from supporting advocacy journalism, for example, um, because of this fear that it's uh, it's somehow like against the rules, right, um, for foundations uh, for for tax purposes to support advocacy journalism or media. Um, luckily, um, I work at a foundation that is. Um, kind of not, um, that's not some, we don't, we don't see it that way. Um, and we're uh, excited to support movement media and I'm very excited to support movement media. There are a lot of um, amazing community organizations that have a lot of exciting media projects happening right now. Um, for example, the Amistad Law Project um, and so many others that are um, partnering with media organizations to shift the narrative. And um, so I think in, in terms of in this sphere that I'm in now in philanthropy, um, my, my goal is to really kind of push some of those boundaries um, and to um, support black and brown led organizations, um, to support organizations that maybe, or individuals who haven't ever received a grant before. Um, what we're hearing is that uh, particularly in the filmmaking community, a lot of independent filmmakers, um, they, it's, it's difficult to get funding. It's difficult to get a grant that's more than like 2,500. Films cost a lot of money to create. People need access to networks. Um, people need mentoring and training. Um, and so I'm really excited um, to help support media makers um, in terms of getting them the funding they need so that they can sustain the work. I mean, I left my job, my youth media job, because it was no, it was not sustainable. A lot of youth, a lot of media people working in media organizations are overworked and underpaid. And so, how do we, how do we address those things? And then also, how do we connect people? How do we support networks and collaboration um, so that organizations and individuals can thrive and um, and share their work? Yes, thank you. That's so useful. And I'm sorry about the outdated bio. <laughs> um, one thing I'll, I'll, I'll say, first, I agree with both of the panelists wholeheartedly um, in all of their observations. Uh, just real quick, the consolidation and the ongoing ownership um, of media, of commercial and nonprofit media, um, it's just, it's dangerous, right? The, the, the less people that have more power to influence the public um, in this day and age is just not good. So this consolidation, um, we should be worried about, but we know that the business model in its sense could not sustain itself. And we know that the business model has never been able to um, uh, really uh, both one, serve communities of color and two, still be able to um, function within a capitalistic society. So there has always been this, uh, I think, this the direction that we're seeing with the amount of layoffs that we're seeing. And the pandemic is obviously exasperating a lot of these things. But, you know, the ongoing layoffs and the consolidation is, is just going to really create larger walls and more gatekeeping of who's able to produce media within these platforms. The benefit, the silver lining, the only silver lining, or one of the silver linings, I think I would say, is that you have more opportunities of journalists um, looking to still make an impact, looking to still tell stories, looking to still do journalism. And um, the, the opportunity to engage 
and grow your base and have more journalists freelancing and, and looking at ways to tell stories differently without the constraints or really living in a toxic work environment that you are forced to kind of, you know, report in a certain manner or have to be looked over the shoulder in, in your reporting. There's an opportunity for journalists who um, still want to do journalism but are no longer in a commercial media space that you can still create media. And there's an opportunity to, to work and, and align with activists and advocates who are also doing their own journalism and tell stories from, from, a, from a true perspective, so to speak. Um, one that is not broadcasted in the way that it's broadcasted in a distorted lens, so to speak. So um, it's, it's tough to see, but you know, I, I think when we think about the future of media, um, the, the way that corporate media is, is shaking up to be is that uh, they're in survival mode and they're gonna do anything to protect their assets and they don't really care about changing for the better. So um, there's an opportunity to really change how we control and, and create our own media for our own communities. So, so. Great, thank you. Um, so I think on that note, I'm hoping you can each share a bit about the projects or stories that you're currently working to tell um, or hoping to tell the issues that you think are you know, most crucial, um, maybe should most be funded in this particular moment in terms of thinking about um, media advocacy. Um, well, you know, and it's, it, that's, I think it's a great question and it's a hard question because there's so many, you know, there's so much work that I, I believe should be funded. <laughs> um, so, but I will say that, you know, for over 26 years, my work has focused on disrupting and ending sexual violence and specifically looking at, um, the violence, um, sexual violence in the community from which I come from in this lifetime, which is the black community. So my film, Know the Rape Documentary, um, and now my anthology, Love with Accountability, Digging Up the Roots of Child Sexual Abuse, which is, um, over, I mean, no, and, um, and Love with Accountability combined features the voices, the right writings and voices of about 70 um, diasporic Black folks who are survivors, who are advocates, scholars, activists, um, talking, um, first disclosing the, the harm that they've experienced, but also looking at how we can disrupt and end this pandemic of, of, of sexual violence without relying on the carceral system. So that's the work that I have been committed to doing. Um, it's deeply personal. As I said, I am a survivor, both of child sexual abuse and adult rape. So it's, it's definitely personal, but it is also political. Um, and now my next project is From Love to Justice, which again is gonna be centering um, storytelling as a praxis to end um, sexual abuse in, um, in, in, in Black communities. Um, one of the things that I think is very powerful about media, and I think one of the reasons why it is, it is a constant battle, if you will, to be able to tell our stories is because, you know, it really shapes how we think about everything, right? And so, um, you, I mean, in terms of how how we how how we're informed about things, that media is so powerful. Um, and so, and I think that that's why we have to continue to really push to use it. Um, and I think that for me, as I, I said earlier with my um, previous comments, that I think the the struggle that I observe having is how 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 do you talk about how do I talk about sexual violence um, and accountability outside of prisons and policing in 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 this in these heightened moments of and realities continuous let me just be clear around white supremacy um, and, and 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 white violence committed against community so for me it's like the work about how do we deal with address disrupt in the violence committed against our communities while we're simultaneously disrupting and ending the violence committed within our communities and doing it without relying on the very brutal systems that have that are the foundation of this country and that that are just destroying it also they're the foundational and they're also destroying um, and I think that that work is I mean there are funders who are interested in supporting that but it is also it's some um, it's people are nervous around talking about that because you're really talking about disrupting foundational tenants Um, well, Taheed, I know you're going to talk about, well, I don't know if you're going to talk about it, but I'm really excited about the project you're working on, um, Media 2070, um, which is a, a, a consortium 
uh, campaign organization, I don't know how to describe it, about um, basically reimagining what media can look like and, and media reparations. So, um, but I'm sure you're gonna talk more about that, but I'm very excited about that project. Um, I'm, I mean, in terms of like thinking about young people, the young people's voices are often missing in mainstream media. Um, and, and often, you know, weaponized or stereotyped in many ways. Um, I'm a, a strong advocate for youth media. I think um, it's very exciting when, um, when, they, when their platforms are amplified. I think like at Black Star I was really excited to, to create a space. I mean, there aren't many film festivals at the, you know, at the caliber of, of Black Star, for example, that actually um, make space for young people to, sh to share their work. And, and that's huge. I think um, I'm excited about projects that um, aren't afraid to shy away from like complexity and nuance. It's my dad, okay. <laughs> um, I'm in his office, so it's only, you need to talk back. This this is yours. Mm -hmm. Sorry, guys. Okay, we love your dad, actually. So yeah, this is my dad, Len. Hello, everyone. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think uh, it's important to for communities. I'm excited about projects and organizations that are really grounded in community, that are sharing community voices or youth voices in ways that are complicated and nuanced and not oversimplified, which unfortunately has been the case a lot of the time, you know, with mainstream media, this idea that we have to be objective and that if it, you know, it can't be biased and, um, you know, basically prioritizing profit over, um, over the real stories of the, of the, of the values um, around social change. And, um, so yeah, I'm excited about Media 2070 and uh, the youth media groups in, in, in Philadelphia, the um, film festivals like the Asian Film, film Festival, the Latino Film Festival, Black Star, um, creating spaces for um, community to come together and to uh, share work and be heard. Ooh, I, it's hard to follow up with, with, with with that that's the, i should always go first i feel like because it's just like i there's just so much to talk about after following up with with both of you so um the question uh the, what was even the question i'm sorry i was just like listening no worries no worries so what are you currently working on what projects and stories are you oh yes yes yes, yes. and what projects and stories do you think you know folks should be being keyed into and paying attention to in terms of media advocacy and and community issues Yes. So uh, for the second part, I'll, I'll answer real quickly. Um, I think, you know, I, I want to see more attempts for uh, Spanish speaking and other language um, just to have all this COVID-19 information out there. Um, the, the language barrier is, is really critical. And I, I think that um, advocacy organizations that are working to translate like important documentation, important language policy news, um, that's important to get to get out. And um, often these aren't guaranteed resources in newsrooms where you have people who are able to um, translate and, and create different various languages for your community. So um, I think that's going to be a, a pretty big priority uh, to continue to make sure that all communities are being informed. And because of that language barrier too, we should be cognizant of that when we're creating content. Um, not everyone speaks English. Uh, so the first part um, to your question. Um, so my job is a free, uh, free press project manager, and I am leading the police and violence narrative project in Philly. And the focus is to basically work um, both in community and with journalists and help shift the narrative as we see journalists cover crime, as we see journalists cover policing, as, and as we see coverage of the criminal legal system. Um, my idea is to uh, work with journalists to not center and focus on authoritative sources, particularly police and those that work in the carceral system, and really look at centering a lot of the issues that we're seeing around policing, centering the perspectives, the expertise, the solutions from community members and groups that are actually working to address these issues at the local, hyper-local neighborhood level. 
um, even block level, so to speak. And so the idea is that there are two realities that we're seeing, one that is distorted and really centered around white values, um, and the other that is the reality of really a black city that is anchored by poverty and anchored by over-policing and too many instances of the criminal legal system because of the laws. And so, you know, it's by, by being able to work on shifting that narrative and really addressing the issues that add context and nuance to the environmental and the societal um, factors that lead to a lot of things around gun violence, uh, over-policing, um, divestment, then we'll be able to give audiences a lot more thorough understanding of the uh, factors that you don't often see that explain the reasons behind some of these uh, institutions, the, the corruptions, and the ways that a lot of these communities function. Um, the Walter Wallace Jr. murder was really another case study as to how the media can do a better job at talking about the factors of lack of mental health resources, lack of investment in the neighborhood, lack of um, transportation, lack of um, uh, you know, just basic necessities. And so there's, there's always an opportunity to really look at the people who are impacted at the root level and talk about the root issues that have made this, um, these types of instances boil up. And so by working in coalition with groups like Amistad Law, uh, Movement Alliance Project, Reclaim, YASP, um, Power, uh, and the Mike Center, um, we're, we're, we're looking at ways at not only narrating and showing the historical harms that crime reporting has done on black and brown communities, but how can we actively work with journalists to shift their sourcing, shift their perspective, shift their entire reporting structure to actually address these issues and not really give that 6,000 feet in the air, very broad stroke um, reporting that doesn't actually address the information needs of these communities that are impacted by these institutions. So um, I dropped a link in the chat that talks about the Police and Violence Narrative Project, which is what we're calling the Shift the Narrative Project. And then I'll touch real quickly on the Media 2070 Project. I also dropped the paper there. The Media 2070 Project, the, the Media Reparations for Black Communities paper is a phenomenal document and one that has really just opened up my eyes. Um, it's, it's allowed me to really say, oh, we can think like that? Like, oh, we can, we can dream like that. And to, to be able to just, you know, talk about the harms of, 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 of our media, but to talk about what could reparations and liberation and, and really investment in black media, what could that look like? What could the outcome of that information look like? And so I highly encourage people to look up the Media 2070 project. I highly continue, um, I highly encourage people to look at the uh, Police and Violence Narrative Project that Free Press is efforting that I'm leading as part of the Free Press. Uh, and I'm excited to be doing this work in Philly um, just because there's, there's a yearn for this and there's an interest in this and it's now, it's needed now more than ever. And so I'm excited to be part of this um, work. Great, thank you so much. And yeah, this is actually the second panel of the day where the Media 2070 project has been shouted out. So like, I think if you follow the hashtag, the Black Media Makers hashtag on Twitter, you'll see a tweet from them on there. And um, Tahid will resend the link because he only sent it to us, the other panelists, he'll send it to everybody if somebody hasn't done that already. Um, but I think that's actually a good place to segue to our questions. We're getting some good questions here and I wanna make sure we have time to dig into all of them. Um, I'm gonna start with a question from Alicia Bell. Um, she asks, considering the ways that storytelling with an explicitly activist and advocacy lens crosses over journalism, filmmaking, um, and into other arts and culture spaces, I'm wondering whether there are initiatives or structural changes you've seen in other arts and culture spaces that people in media can learn from. I thought this was a great question. <laughs> Thoughts on this? I'm just going to echo that that's my colleague. Alicia Bell is amazing. Thank you for the great question. I'm curious uh, to hear from that as well. I don't have, I unfortunately, I started off my journey into film and visual media was my entry point, but I don't have a whole deep context or um, relationship or community in the arts and film area. But uh, good question, Alicia. 
You know, I, I'm, and this isn't my work at all, but I, I think a lot about Scribe Video Center's um, Precious Places, which is um, this uh, a collaborative where um, filmmakers, um, independent filmmakers in Philadelphia um, are work um, with organizations, community arts organizations in the Philadelphia, Delaware Valley area um, to document like you know, landmarks or places that were once landmarks. Um, and that I, I think that, that it's a way of, it, it is a mixture of documentation, like of journalism, but then also really highlighting landmarks that, I mean, not just African-American, but really specific, a lot of it is grounded in um, in marginalized communities in Philadelphia, um, places, landmarks that, you know, people just didn't know that we kind of have lost the, the history of. And so, I mean, I, I think a lot about um, um, that work in terms of being able to really to both document and also kind of celebrate the arts. That's just one thing that immediately comes to mind. <clears throat> yeah, and I think shout out to Precious Places. They're doing amazing work um, documenting neighborhood stories. Um, I, I'm also really excited about the kind of like community engagement um, outreach campaign sphere and how that is really um, supporting filmmaking right now. Um, there's an organization called Working Films that um, works with uh, filmmakers and pairs them with community organizations that are um, connected to the, the, the narratives that the filmmakers are addressing. And then thinking about how they can work together to, to really help um, community engage with that media content and engage in the issues. Um, and I'm excited that uh, there, I know there needs to be more like funding and support for that kind of, those kind of partnerships, but I'm excited that um, IPMF is, that's an area that we're, um, we're interested in supporting. I think, you know, it's one thing to tell a story and then it's another thing to really think about how do you, how do you in 2020 use all of the resources you can to really help that story um, be heard and help folks engage with it and help p potentially like, you know, challenge policy. Um, and it's, it's really an art, it's a whole, and so there's, um, I'm glad that there are resources like Working Films, um, like even like Firelight Media in New York um, that are helping filmmakers really, um, create media and then distribute it in ways that are that are um, impactful. Yeah, I think that's actually a good segue um, to the next question because it's specifically about this question um, of support for that type of media. Um, it's from Sanjay Jolly um, and he asks, can you talk more about the various mechanisms and pressure points to push the foundation world to adequately support movement media? It seems from the outside like the overwhelming tendency of foundation support for movement orgs is to discipline or co-op radical aspirations towards sort of more reformist aspirations. So what structural or organizational limits um, do conscientious program officers like Nuala face in advocating for more radical grassroots media agenda? I think that question's for everyone, but Nuala, you can probably start. Yeah, I can start. Um, and Ayesha, I wanna thank you for sending me that, that video about black women in philanthropy earlier this week. Um, I, I think boards matter. Like, um, I think it's important that the leadership of foundations represent the community they serve. And um, I'm really glad that we're, uh, IPMF is, um, IPMF's board is uh, really um, addressing that issue. And uh, I think, yeah, I think uh, you need to have, ultimately foundations need to be pushed to listen to community, to respond, to, um, to engage with community um, and to have people from community connected to community involved in decision making. And so, for example, um, we just had a grant cycle where four community stakeholders um, with experience in, in media, film and arts uh, nominated individual filmmakers for grants. And nobody told that, like once they made those nominations, 
you know, they were approved. It wasn't a question, there wasn't anybody who was going to, um, there weren't red tape around that. We need to, tr we need to identify folks in the community who are, um, who know community, who are engaged and, and trust them, um, pay them as experts, uh, listen to them. Um, but yeah, I, I do, um, I'm really glad that I work at IPMF because I know there are a lot of foundations that are a lot more um, conservative. Wouldn't work out for me. <laughs> that, wouldn't, that wouldn't work for me at all. Um, but I'm curious to hear what Aisha and Tahid have to say. Yeah, I'm so glad. Well, first I wanted to say in terms of my indirect relationship with where you work, um, Noela, is that I, I started in the 90s, I started uh, producing for WYBE TV. And that was when I did two shows, Out of the Closet and On Sisters, which was Void Out of the Closet, which is about the queer LGBTQ community, and On Sisters is about women of African descent. And this was an example of kind of like the opportunity, it reminds me of Philly Cam, like this opportunity to be able to produce shows um, that were of service to, uh, to the community and um, issues specifically. What I, what I will say as somebody who has been an independent cultural worker and most of my livelihood is based on funding, it representation and not just representation in terms of what is like how you look, but what are your politics matters in terms of um, who the funders are. Most of the time, most of the people, the grant officers who have greenlit um, anything that I've received, any funding that I've received have, uh, you know, either been um, women of color, queer, a, a progressive anti-racist uh, white folks who really supported the vision and work. And so I think that that is the word. And, and a lot of that has been like up until recently, really a lot smaller funds who did not have the resources to give you those huge grants that um, a lot of these huge foundations um, that tend to not take the risk. And, you know, and so I think that that's when you don't have the particular credentials and all that people want to, you know, make themselves feel comfortable. So I think that that's, that is, is really critical in terms of like, you know, the, the whole philanthropy wall that we, that, that just continues to be, um, um, disrupted. And, and so I'm really excited about you being a pro when I heard that I was like, Whoa, that's so great. You know, because not, you know, not only your politic, but then also how you live as a media maker and doing the work with, um, with youth, um, with youth makers. So I think that that really, you understand it. And I think that that is what's um, really critical um, in, in that work. Yeah, there's not much for me to follow up on other than just the plus one that the, the makeup of the board matters, program officers and directors matter. Uh, when you're researching and you're, you're looking at that, you kind of have to take that into consideration of who you're, who you're actually talking to, who, who's, who's taking the, 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 the control to distribute and allocate resources. So um, that's just to say is that it's important for people to understand what boards do, who's on the board, what are their politics, what's their history. Um, those are factors that you can take into consideration too, because they all come into account. So just wanted to echo that, that it's good information to always have. Thanks. And um, we have a question actually from uh, Jennifer Posner, who's Noela and I have known for a very long time. And Aisha, you know her too, right? Like I I, know everyone, her, yeah. in, everyone in feminist media spaces uh, knows her. So thanks for being here, Jen. Um, Jen asks, on the policy side of media activism, what do you consider the most important policies, interventions, solutions that folks should be supporting or pursuing right now and in the next few years, specifically on questions of race and gender justice? Oh, there is, there is, oh, go, go ahead. Sorry, I cut you off. No, no, no. <laughs> There's so much, like, I didn't even know I was all like, <laughs> um, gosh, um, I don't, ooh. I mean, I, I think, I, I think that there, I think that 
there, there, it is critical that there is a recognition and acknowledgement that there are people on the ground who've been on the ground doing um, this work. So I think like this, the kind of, not that Jen is asking this question, but the, the notion so often is like, oh, we've got to f figure out or what's happening, that the work is happening. And, and it's really so much about, you know, how do you turn your attention to what's going on rather than kind of reinventing um, the, the wheel. Um, and so, I mean, I, I think a lot about like, um, the work, for instance, of, of, of Miriam Kaba, who does, I mean, just an incredible prison abolitionist who really uses media in terms of with others. I mean, she does not work in isolation, um, but in terms of um, videos, YouTube videos, zines, accessibility to really break it down. Like, what what do we mean when we're saying when we're saying defund the police, and and specifically in relationship to violence to violence? I don't want to say just women because humans are sexually assaulted, men, women, children, gender non-binary people, and that is often thrown up as like kind of like what are you going to do about the rapist? And so I think that you know in terms of the these types of um, interventions that there's a lot of work like insight um, of women and trans people of color uh, against violence that they really again draw an intersectional lens of, in response to state sanctioned violence and inner partner um, violence or intimate violence or you know personal violence um, so that I, I think and um, survived and punished and really has a lot does important incredible work so there's like work out um, in 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 the world that where folks are using media to do serious grassroots um, education on um, popular education. So making it accessible so that it is not just this kind of like theoretical, but it is applied practice um, and, and really um, not like, oh, it's fun doing this work, but just really making it seem like that anyone can can access it, that you don't have to be in some ivory tower having, you know, deep, um, yeah, being disconnected from, from the people, that these folks are with and among the people in, in sharing this information. Uh, I have so many that I'm just going to go down the list of things that I, I wanted to, to say that are, there's just so much, there's, there's just so much, but let's talk about First, real quick, and some of these are specifically free press things. So, you know, I'm just going to hype this up real quick that free press is working on this, but there's also other organizations, Color of Change, Media Justice, working on this. But digital divide, um, there's there's a growing digital divide that there's a lot of media advocacy around that we need to address. Um, specifically, we've seen it here in Philly with the pandemic in virtual training um, or teaching rather. Um, not a lot of kids have access to internet. Not everyone has access to internet, and there's a digital divide. So, we need to talk about that. We need to talk about broadband and internet access for all so that people can actually get online and actually have um, available uh, you know, information. We need to talk about Title II and net neutrality. We need to talk about the FCC. Um, we need to talk about ma uh, media reparations for black communities again. Um, and then we need to talk about changing the beats. For me specifically, I would say changing, you know, getting rid of the crime beat as we know it and focusing on abolition, focusing specifically on police violence, focusing specifically on the carceral state and focusing on specific communities of colors and the LGBT community as well. There needs to be specific um, space within a newsroom to cover um, all aspects of the communities, um, all types of diverse communities. And then, um, you know, the, the, in my opinion, the biggest thing that we need to address is completely changing the power dynamics within newsrooms and media companies as a whole. You can't expect to change culture in a newsroom when the power structure is completely white, when the people on the board are majority white, when the people on the board are majority white and men, when people leading are, are white. When you have all sorts of power dynamics where there are more people that um, pe there's less representation at the top, none of the culture is gonna be able to change because the people at the top are actually not reflective of these values and they're not coming from the communities that actually care about this too. So I, I think that there's a lot of opportunities to support journalists of color, support um, you know, people that are trying to change the media diversity on the outside and on the inside. And um, I think that you know, it's a tough fight, but it's so important because we, need, we still need representation in these newsrooms. We still need to have this opportunity to speak on these platforms. And even though we're seeing a, a consolidation of journalism, we should still be able to support the, the journalists that have been able to get in and try to report on these issues for the greater good. So um, a whole list of, of, of necessities, but I think they're all equally important. I'll second everything they said. Um, 
yeah, I, I do think that uh, that representation matters, but also as um, Aisha mentioned earlier, um, politics matter. So it's not just about having like brown places and high place, brown faces in high places, but what are their politics? Um, are they grounded in community? Are they listening to community? Um, I had an interesting conversation with an organizer yesterday about um, a newspaper, you know, was looking for organizers to talk about uh, black women of color organizing in Philly. And essentially the, um, they basically had a script in their mind, a narrative they wanted to share. And, and they took the, the, the interview and they kind of, made it fit into that rather than basically just listening to the person about what 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 it was and um is is as long as that continues to happen there's going to be a mistrust between community and communities and um these institute these media institutions and so um yeah i encourage everybody to to look into the um the area the, the campaigns and the projects that tahid mentioned Great, thank you. So I have one final question um, for you all before we run out of time. So over the course of the day, uh, it's been really interesting because um, in some ways, even though each panel has been made up of folks with um, sort of different expertise and a different um, focus, we've had some repeated themes come up um, about sort of who's in spaces in pa of power and what stories are being told in those spaces. Um, and so I'm wondering if you could each sort of reflect maybe just even from your own experience on a story when you've seen it work, um, when a story that needed to be told was supported and told well, and what about that can sort of inspire us um, in, you know, going forward in, in terms of telling other stories, whether it's in grassroots and independent activist media or for black media makers in more mainstream spaces. And I, I could tell by your, your body language, I made you all think because you all went at the same time. <laughs> Let me just get a little clarity. So are you talking, does it need to be independent and mass mediated or what do you know? Anything that, that you feel like is an example of when, you know, a story needed to be told and it was actually told well, and it reflected, you know, maybe a community that historically their story wasn't told. I, you know, I think one of the things we're trying to take away from today is um, not just the experiences of black media makers, but what they're asking in terms of change in in narrative and in industries to get these stories told. So I'm wondering if we have like hopeful stories of when it works. Yeah, and I and I I walk gingerly because I am really I'm, I'm an abolitionist. I I, I definitely and, and when I'm about to share this, but I, I really I I think about surviving R. Kelly and I think about how powerful that work under Dream Hampton's uh, leadership vision, um, how powerful that that series was, and it was powerful because it really put. Um, sexual violence committed. I mean, it was just one person, R. Kelly, and this is, it, you know, it's it transcends R. Kelly, but it really centered Black women survivors. That's really what I want to get at, it, it, and, and girls. Um, it put it on a, a mainstream, mass mediated level. So it was just something that I never thought it was even possible that I would see in my own lifetime as somebody who spent. 12 years working to make a film about uh, ending rape and sexual violence in black communities. And so, and, and just how it was everywhere, how powerful it was and that it, it, it created um, just a, a level of visibility that as a black woman survivor, I and know many, we all know, but in terms of that it was on network television everywhere. And when I say I walk gingerly, not in terms of how the work was received and all that, but just like you know i don't think that prison is is the uh solution but it was the first time when things started moving towards some form of accountability for for um r kelly you know like it was just a really interesting thing to observe that i just hadn't seen in that way that i think is is really powerful and there are many other examples that is not at that at that 
mass mediated level, but it is just something that I think should be uh, lifted up, particularly because it was a black woman director um, and, 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 and many um, black women filmmakers involved in, including editors that I just think that that was really uh, critical in terms of telling our story, black woman who's a survivor director, telling our stories um, on a national platform. Yeah, thanks for that. That's a great example. One that's, I'll give, I'll give two. Um, one briefly, which was um, at the local level, um, we, I used to work with a, uh, a black journalist, her name was Tylisa Johnson. She did really good reporting on the whole uh, issue of lack of funding to libraries. And library coverage, in, at the time when I was working at the Philadelphia Inquirer, libraries weren't like a centered covered thing. They're, they weren't really talked about on a daily basis, but Tylisa had really looked at just the, the value that libraries bring for communities, the, the uh, convening space, the information, the education. And really, it was one of the awesome times I was able to, even on the analytics, track the impact that she was having, tracking the growth in the sharing and the conversations around libraries, and then seeing the advocacy groups really you know, use that as a way to argue for more funding and, and try to get some more uh, reallocation of resources from, I think, the state budget at the time. And what had happened eventually is that I, I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, if I'm, if I'm misremembering, but like both city council did use, and this is pre-COVID, city council allocated some funding to, to uh, local libraries and so did the state, but at a state level. And so we don't know how much is actually reaching Phillies per se, but they were able to allocate some of the resources or funding for lo uh, local libraries, as far as I remember. And that was just incredible because it was like such a topic that's really under the radar compared to a, a lot of things. And like, it was just, you were just able to see every story, every update that she had, whether it was talking to politicians, community activists, and being in the libraries and talking to people, you could just see that in interest really grow. So that was really cool. The second thing I'll say, is the uh, Black Caucus and uh, the Los Angeles Times Black Caucus, their ability to mobilize and organize um, so effectively to get their publisher to not only admit an apology, but that the LA Times actually addressing its own harms. Um, yeah. I was talking with Alicia Bell and Colette uh, Watson and, and, and the people uh, who, who really authored, Joseph Torres, who really authored the Media 2070 uh, um, project and the media reparations paper to get a a newsroom, a commercial media corporation to acknowledge its own racism and like put that out publicly, I think it's instrumental because it, it, it sets a baseline of acknowledging your harms and putting that consciousness out to everybody and being transparent and saying, we did some messed up stuff and we are standing on that and we need to acknowledge that. That's a lot of accountability moving forward when we're thinking about how are we, um, you know, reforming uh, media as we know it at a commercial level. So right. the Black Caucus in LA, the Los Angeles Black Caucus really hats off on that. Yeah. Um, I was actually thinking about dreams film as well, um, Aisha. Um, and I think another film or media um, that kind of went mainstream a little bit was um, I May Destroy You, the series. Um, yeah, I think, I think it just, it just, what I appreciated about that that series was that um, it was nuanced, it was complicated, it was um, it had a, a black woman lead. Uh, it's a series about um, a survivor um, of sexual violence, uh, actually um, survivors of sexual violence, and their their stories are really centered. Um, and you know, not everyone's going to watch a documentary, but um, I appreciated that this was like a, a narrative, even though I think it was loosely based off of um, the author's true, true experience. Um, it, it was, it's another narrative filmmaking is a, is a vehicle to reach folks um, who may not tune into um, a documentary or may not read an article, but mm -hmm. are still kind of craving uh, these, these stories. Um, and so I really appreciated that. Um, yeah, that series. Yeah, on Netflix. Thank you for that. That's um, I had I've forgotten about the Los Angeles uh, Times editorial. So I appreciate your 
remind her about that because that was a remarkable moment, especially for such a mainstream institution. But all of those examples are fantastic. So I just want to thank you all. This has been fantastic. I want to thank our attendees um, who have hung in actually past time for the last panel. Um, we've had between 100 and 170 attendees for every single session today, which is just I'm impressed because I know everyone has Zoom fatigue. Um, your time is so precious. And so thank you so much. I will let our panelists go and do what they need to do. Um, and I just want to end with um, a closing thanks once again for um, uh, the folks at the Mike Center who uh, you know, supported me in organizing this event and the folks at the Center for Media at Risk who co-sponsored. Um, a few people have asked about the recording of the full day, folks who weren't able to be here live. And the re this was recorded and I am not the IT person, so I can't tell you exactly where the recording is gonna go or when it's gonna be up, but we will definitely tweet it. Um, you can either follow me or the Mike Center or the Center for Media at Risk, but certainly follow these three fabulous people and all of our other panelists um, for the day. And we so appreciate um, everyone being here. And we hope that this has been useful in thinking through um, a variety of issues, both in terms of sort of practice and theory in thinking through questions of um, representation uh, in, in the barriers Black media, media makers face, the unique stories they tell, the potential and sort of innovation that they're offering, and really as a call to action for thinking through um, what stories we can be telling better and more of um, in the future. So thank you to everyone again for being here. And I think that's a wrap.